Hey, we're live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios. I'm Hank Strange. Tonight, we have a super special guest on tonight. G-Webs, Gun Websites, is on with us tonight. So he's going to be here. We're going to talk, answer questions, go over whatever we want to. Um, I know there's, there's some people coming in right now. So, um, you know, we'll do a little bit of stuff before we get into that. I want to thank everyone that's been hanging out in the uh, chat for a while. I know we're starting a little bit late. Uh, hit us up with questions, comments, stuff you guys want to talk about, all that good stuff, and we will get to it. Um, don't forget to like this video, like the video, make sure you're subscribed, and definitely share this with your friends on social media. We need all the help that we can do to get this pumped up and going. So, um, G-Webs, thanks for joining us, my friend. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Cool. Yeah, thanks man. for going on late, too. Appreciate it. Oh, that's that's cool. Listen, for you, anything. Right for on. you, anything, man. You know, I've been, like, way before I ever did a YouTube channel, I looked at your stuff, you know? And I always found it really cool and informative. There's, like, so many videos. I'm sure the other folks out there feel the same way, but there's so many videos that I've seen because, dude, you have, like, 4,000 videos on YouTube. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I'm about to hit 4,000. I was trying to think yeah. about what to do for the <laughs> thousandth one there's really not a cool like four thousand gun thing that i can think of like a model four thousand or anything oh my god so i don't know what to do yeah that would be so cool because you're like how many are you like 20 away or 18 something it's like cool. that yeah, i don't even know and then you know you can always fiddle with it i could delete something or something if i had to mm -hmm. get right in there but yeah i haven't looked in a minute but it's getting there that's so awesome man i don't think anyone else has achieved that and and i know from making videos myself is not easy. <laughs> so. I don't know. Custom Lover was always gave me a run for my money. I don't know, and he's probably been doing videos more regularly than I have over the last couple of years. Who did you say? Cutlery Lover, Jeff. Oh, Cutler. Okay, yeah. Um, well, because yeah, he does them on a daily, so that's a lot of potential. He he deletes some of his, I think. Oh, okay. Do you delete any? Not really. I'm just lazy. I don't leave them up there for any reason. There's obviously no reason, but right. But it's, it's good to have them archived, man. I think uh, I'm trying to think back to, I remember even when I was thinking about doing a YouTube channel, you did a video, it's way back, about like the top YouTubers. You remember that? Top gun YouTubers? Yeah, I think so. For like, uh, that was a while back. That was like before 13 even. Yeah, yeah, that's going, you know, that's going way back. There's a, there's a bunch of cool ones. I like when you, sh um, you showed the, AR, the um, NRA Museum yeah there's so many cool things in there man you know um for i guess there's probably a few gun folks out there who haven't who don't know who you are and all that kind of stuff can you tell us you know like who you are how you started doing this how you got into making youtube videos and vlogging um, and all that i'm just a dude down here in tucson so a bunch of us worked at aol right so we were playing on the internet and having a good time and then uh there was we were going fishing and there was just we were posting pictures of our fish and stuff where we'd go hunting and post pictures of our hunting areas for our friends back east and uh there were really no websites for that so it was just easy enough back then to just build a website for it that turned into a whole bunch of websites and some clients and stuff and then when we all left aol and started doing websites all the time um you know it was mostly hunting and fishing type of stuff and then when it came along it was just a, a way to put video up cheap because back in the day it cost money to put video up on the internet and every once in a while a video is could explain something a lot quicker than a bunch of pictures or a blog or something so uh that's how we started using youtube and then when we became a partner or whatever and youtube started paying people that was pretty awesome so then we really got into it yeah so i mean you you, you guys are pioneers of this thing who do you remember was around back how how long ago was that like what year did, did you start we didn't start doing stuff till 09, right? 2009. Okay. None Fancy was already super established. I mean, he was already the king of all videos at that point. He oh, so had, None Fancy was before? Because I think YouTube dates back to what? Like two, like early 2000s, right? Uh, Technically, yeah. Probably like five or four or something. But very few. Mm -hmm. It was all kicked in the nuts videos. And look at my mm -hmm. cat YouTube type of videos. They really didn't start getting being used for like even people doing the vacation stuff, I don't think, until like nine or ten. But none fancy was out there. I remember one of the first videos I even saw that gave me the idea to do stuff 
uh, as video format instead of photo format was him taking apart like a backpacking rig, you know, mm -hmm. all the stuff out of a backpack and the explanations of why and that kind of stuff. Kind of like what you'd see in a backpacking magazine back in the day, but in a video right. form, which is pretty yeah. clever. Yeah, because nothing fancy is so detailed, right? You know, I, I know he's not like everyone's cup of tea, but I actually, because I, I, you know, I've just been doing this gun thing for a couple of years. I don't, I don't have any kind of experience or anything like that. So to me, listen, I know there's people to say, oh, well, that's too long, but I like it because it's like hanging out with an uncle that knows about guns and knives or hunting. Now he's doing watch stuff and all that. I really enjoy it because there's so much information that it would take you a long time to find otherwise. Yeah. So I'm guessing he's he was been doing that from the beginning. Yeah, and I wouldn't say and, and then um Color Be Lover was already around back then doing more of the mm -hmm. like video blog, just kind of his daily life kind of thing, sharing his his exploration. I think he was still kind of learning guns and knives and stuff back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh and then when did uh when did monetization and all that come into to play? <laughs> I think ten, eleven, something like that. And you had to okay. be invited as a partner originally right and I, what the criteria was it was probably number of views or something and then uh, you get invited in as a partner and then i don't know it was, it was very little money at the beginning but it was neat to get paid instead of having to pay because still back then it was if you wanted to put a, a lot of content on the internet video wise you had to pay for server space so it was like the opposite of that it was pretty neat yeah absolutely and and we may we may wind up going back to that <laughs> oh yeah right? you know what do you think about all the stuff that's going on nowadays with YouTube in terms of, uh, I don't think it's just us gun guys, there's lots of other people. I know definitely folks doing politics and all that, co uh, political commentary, etc. You know, that they're kind of like demonetizing, marginalizing, trying to shift us off somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. Uh, it's good for just, you know, the evolution and the development of everything. Um, I really like the concept of this new media, the way that it's interactive. Like this, the stuff that we're doing right now, this this teleconferencing was big mm -hmm. back in the day. It's still pretty big money if you just set this up for your own business or something. So right. the fact that we can use this and it democratizes the like distribution of information, I really like that part of it. So what I've not liked over the last couple of years with the uh, the way that the like polish has happened to YouTube, I call it. It's mm -hmm. like they've just taken television shows and rebranded them onto YouTube. So because there was like that free money, you know, there was that money no matter what. As long as you did something, you were getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to change it around. And that's good. It's healthy for it because now you'll have to be doing something worthwhile that people actually appreciate because you're going to have to have a little bit more interaction personally with your audience than just number of views. You know, there was ways to game the system with the old system. Right. So I think and, development mm -hmm. overall, it's a little tougher. And I don't think, I, don't, I think content will be better for it. I think content was starting to suffer. Oh, you do? Okay. So in yeah. terms of like how guys are getting their videos demonetized and all that, even like, you know, I just, for example, all the, uh, I've done like, this is, I don't know, this is like 40 something, maybe 48 on our hangouts. And they just went through and demonetized every single one. And then we have to go back through and individually request you know, that they turn back on the monetization on that. Um, and there's some other things that have happened, right? You know, what do you think about those things? Or do you think that's still all part of the good and what's going to lead to something better? Um, I think that, uh, um, I hear you, the same thing happened to us, all our podcasts. I don't know if it's a time thing, because there's no way they listen to all our podcasts, right, to know that we said something that's inappropriate. I think it's just a time thing that, uh, that uh, advertisers don't want to be on something that's an hour long, so that's why we're not appropriate for uh, advertising. But anyway, I think that's chasing the tail at this point. Um, it might be something that comes back, YouTube money, but I, I think that, you know the Patreons and the other uh, things that are out there that are like that are going to end up being where we see people go. We were just looking at Patreon numbers the other day, and it's it's massive. You know, mm -hmm. The number of people that use it and the number of people that uh, like uh, participate in the content they like. It's something like millions of dollars a month already. Yeah, I think one of the things is that um, people have to shift over, right? You know, it's just a, a way of doing things that everyone hasn't thought about. 
And, um, you know, there were previously guys that were maybe smaller YouTube channel wise, but, they, you know, they've been doing Patreon from the beginning or very early. And um, then there's guys who are really big, but they never did Patreon. So now, every, you know, and, and, and right now at this point, everyone's pretty much trying to do it. I think we just started maybe doing it seriously like six months ago. But, you know, and I think it is a good thing. I think it makes you connect with who your core audience is. Yeah. And, you know, and have to deal with and serve those people in some way. Yeah. I mean, it, it, YouTube it got us to where we were looking at uh, viewers, right? All right. How are we looking at? We were looking at subs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start looking at hundreds of thousands of subscribers, who do you make your video for? Like even at tens of thousands of subscribers, who do you make your video for? When you have dozens of viewers, you know who you're making your video for. You're having a, a, an ongoing conversation with those viewers. And that's what Patreon allows 12 or 20 viewers to keep a channel going. I mean, if it's a, a grassroots channel where somebody's trying to just get some time on the weekends or some extra ammo to be able to do stuff, uh, Travis, one of the guys over on gun channels, has access to uh, the local gun shop's uh, back room, right? So he can take mm -hmm. on and do videos. So really for him, you know, just a couple of bucks gets him out to the range to be able to continue to do that. And for people that like that kind of I won't call it grassroots type of content creation, then Patreon's the way to go. And yeah. uh, you know, like you say, it's it's gonna be an opportunity for everybody. And then, you know, Patreon's it's a crowd it's a way to raise funds for sure, but because of the way the, the platform's built, I see a lot of potential for uh, the perks and people playing around with those perks. Look how creative people are on their channels and the content they create. And now that we're going to be moving over to Patreon, I think, kind of in mass, uh, I think there's going to be all kinds of ways that people are going to be uh, working with their audience or their viewers to, uh, you know, take it to whole different levels. Whether it be people joining live chats like this or mentioning people or like I'm going to be trying to go to places that people mention. You know, there's just different ways that people are going to be able to interact where YouTube gave us comments but that was it you know and i guess direct comments and then public comments but patreon allows us to make these perk levels so now somebody could say do you want me to do this with my channel or that with my channel or that with my channel and you know put a buck down where you want me to put the, you know with the direction you want me to take my channel so there's just lots of little ways i think we're going to see development of content yeah now what do you think about the other ways that people are doing things like for example we've got people that sponsor us you know, um, and and there's a bunch of other things people are doing. I think, you know, people have affiliate programs going. What do you think about all those things? Affiliates, I've been doing those for a long, long time, and they're difficult. I don't want to lead people into them unless you've got real numbers, significant numbers. Those are really just a trickle. But I think you're when you have like a direct sponsorship, honestly, that's cr that's cr critical. I think that's crucial for the industry as well as just the entertainment and the distribution of content. But um, Again, when you're talking about an individual creator, you don't need much to, to get going. Uh, most of the time our phones can do it, a couple hundred dollars worth of equipment can do it. And uh, even if, we're, again, we're dealing with viewers and not thousands of subscribers, but dozens of viewers, if you're in an area like I was down here in Southern Arizona where there just wasn't a lot of content on the web at the time about the lakes down here, I was 100% of the content about the lakes down here. So you can be that guy who's 100% of the content about maybe the competitive shooting in your area or like we've got clover over on gun channels who does a lot with 4-h um, so there's probably something that you can provide to a local shop or a manufacturer that's going to bring them significant return on whatever little investment they put in your channel and yeah. you don't get a brownells or a midway coming along and they, even though they might want to and have all the interest in doing it they can't support every little manufacturer every little shop that you know works with them but I think that's the symbiotic relationship between content creators who are trying to do it and get bigger and those shops out there that, you know, can't, they can't all give money to Hickok or to Iraqi veteran or something if they want to promote that kind of stuff, but they sure can promote the shop of the little content creators in their area. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, I don't know how people feel about the, the phrasing, but it's kind of like trickle down economics, right? Um, you know, it, they can't get the number one guy they might go to number two, number three, maybe they can't get those guys, they keep going. And we can all help each other out because they're small companies that are starting up and everything today is social media. That's kind of like the phone book or asking a friend, you know, a long time ago, who's a good plumber or who's a good mechanic, it's all on social media. So and those you can kind of things meet up, right? 
yeah, you can be their social media expert. Your thing, you know, as a content creator is going to be in touch with a certain amount of the segment of the audience and, you know, interacting with them and keeping them interested and, you know, having a conversation with them. And then those those shops, they wish they could have somebody like that on the payroll. So, yeah, I think it's definitely, uh, again, it's it's neat because if, if YouTube would have stayed and YouTube would have got even worse and just started pouring money out to content creators, yeah, then we'd see basically the equivalent of kicked in the balls videos. We'd see a bunch of guns, you know, running all kinds of ammo through them and you know everybody would just be desperate to find the newest gun to run the most ammo through or to you know do some kind of you know parody or joke it was just kind of getting repetitive this way it gives people a chance to be creative again and to actually give some honest reviews of stuff yeah it is scary it is scary i think though when uh you know people change the rules but that's life that's life. You have to get used to it. They change the rules. You kind of, you have to, uh, you also have to change. You know, I called my, my, uh, this podcast that I'm doing, Who Moved My Freedom? And I basically uh, modeled it after Who Moved My Cheese. You ever heard about that book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, man, it's reading at AOL. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. It's, yeah. I've, I think I started reading that when, I don't know, I was maybe like 21 years old or something like that. And I read it probably every year, maybe a few times a year, just to remind me that the rules always change and then you have to change and adapt with that. And even in some cases, use those things that are happening to your advantage. Use it as leverage or use it as motivation to move forward and just don't give up or throw your hands up or wait for anyone to come in and save you. Exactly. You know, so now there's a question that um, I'm, uh, Lawrence uh, Lerwick is asking, have you ever thought about creating a YouTube style space, call it GunTube, uh, where content creators can post videos? Um, and then he says, by the way, YouTube is being sued by creators for loss of money. So I guess that's a question and a comment. I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like we're in a mall or something and it's like they've I don't know. I, I hate to, I, I don't understand how people can say that YouTube took something from us. I mean, if we were, if you're doing something on YouTube that made money, that's great. But there, I don't think there was anything in there that said they were obligated to never change. Every year they change and do stuff and you know, they move yeah. on. So, um, as far as building a separate YouTube, Full 30 already exists and they built it from the ground up from what I understand, um, you know, coded it themselves, like actually built their own systems and it's designed to host gun related content. Um, and put that gun related content in direct con uh, contact with gun uh, manufacturers who are, are you know, s s um, um, the uh, sponsors who are gun related, who can't even get on Google. You know, if, if uh, the, uh, the auction or whatever the, those, the various, uh, Henry, all the different uh, sponsors over there in Full 30, uh, they couldn't you know, pay Google to put them in front of our videos even if they, they want it, because Google won't do it. So yeah. both they won't accept advertising money from the firearms industry for the most part. I think I have seen a few things. Well, it's in like yeah. NRA and the, the some CCW insurance, I guess, occasionally mm -hmm. a holster or something. But for the most yeah. part, you know, they're not conducive to that. So I think they've done a good effort, but um, I'm not going to try that. I, I worked at AOL. I know what it's like to build the, the giant servers and stuff, at least a little bit enough to know that I'm not going to want to get into that. I think there's probably room for it, and I'm sure that if Google continues to be anti-gun, and they've done that a little bit here and there, um, I think that we'll see that change eventually. But we had a, we've had discussions like this on our shows before, on other conversations, and somebody brings up some people brought up some good points that if we were, let's say that there was a perfect place that you know could host videos, and we could just take all our gun-related stuff and go set it down over there and live ourselves on the internet over there. I don't know if that's a service to anybody because YouTube is a community it's a it's a community for more than just the gun it's everybody you know car people food people everything so, yeah how does uh, anyone I, discover you you would get so i don't know how many well, like hardcore you, uh, gun guys there are but let's say it's 50 million which i don't think it is but not that are know. that did only watch gun related content yeah gonna, but but then also it doesn't it doesn't bring guns out you know there's no ambassadors to guns out there so many of us who are creating content do gun content and other stuff. We've got car stuff, we've got our food stuff, we've got our other things that we're interested in. So when somebody's out there you know, searching for stuff on the internet, they might find us from eating hot sauce or something, and then just that we go shooting. So I think there's a little bit of uh, that Second Amendment ambassadorship that we get 
by being on YouTube and being a pretty big segment of YouTube. Yeah. So, so I guess I wouldn't want to leave YouTube, uh, even if they weren't paying, which I'm just saying I think the uh, creation of content will evolve without YouTube's involvement of paying us anymore. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that um, the hard part, so I, I, are, you, are you on full 30? No. Okay, because I'm actually on full 30. And um, first of all, right now, the way that it is, you kind of have to get invited or sometimes if someone really gets shut down, then they, you know, they figure out a way to get that person into if they, if they get shut down on YouTube. But it's it's a very, very tough thing to do, like you said, you know, and they just can't open it and then just let everyone come on and start posting the videos there just because of the amount of server space or whatever it is that they would have to pay for. Yeah, it's it's overwhelming. I mean, think about Google. It's one of the largest entities at this point, and that's because they're that's the reason they're able to do what they're doing. But uh, that's what I was saying. There might be an opportunity for that in the future, but it would take some. It would take a, a leap in tech for you know computers yeah. to be much faster and storage much cheaper, and then we'd probably see individual places for almost every area of interest. Carp things would have their own YouTube. You know, music would have its own YouTube. But that's yeah. one of the things about YouTube is that even with the tech side aside, it does bring everybody together and people can share their interests, just like Facebook. You know, people go to Facebook because so many other people are on Facebook. People go to YouTube because so many other people are on YouTube. Yeah, the only time it becomes 100% useless is if they say no gun guys or no this thing or that thing and you have no way of being there. At the least, it's always a thing that you can use to promote whatever else it is that you do. So if you do, there are people who do most of their stuff over on Patreon and they use YouTube just as like a little teaser or to advertise that you can see the rest of the video over here. If someone builds out a platform, you can do it the same way. People can do that with Full 30 or whatever else is out there. If they want to just put you know a little bit of the video on YouTube, put most of it over there. But ultimately, I think what you're saying is true that you know, YouTube is where everyone goes, and and we all want to grow our audience. You know, you want to be, have that potential of reaching more people. So, and it's an established logarithm, and there's plenty of people paying attention to that, and a lot of people experimenting with it. So there are ways yeah. to figure out how to use it. It's a it's a common platform. No, now, with sure. that, we Go did build, we did build gun channels almost four years ago now. So whenever YouTube, remember when YouTube pushed us all over to Google Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook and they really screwed with comments. Uh, that was the end of 2013, I guess. Um, we were getting sick of that, and I really didn't like the idea of going over to Google Plus. It was just so weird to navigate. I just didn't like it. So yeah. uh, a couple of guys got together. We built this thing called Gun Channels. We just took some off-the-shelf um, community software and put a gun theme to it, and it's been running since. So uh, people that want to create content over on YouTube or you know can uh, embed the stuff over there. Uh, people that are on Instagram predominantly uh, can share in the, the conversation over there. We have uh, text chats and that kind of thing. So anybody that's curious about just checking out a community, it's not necessarily uh, video hosting. I mean, you can host videos there, but it's not like Full 30 where it's designed to host videos or anything instead of YouTube. Most of the time people post their stuff on YouTube, uh, you know, have it on their channel or whatever, and then just link it over like you would on Facebook or something. Yeah, we've got a question from someone that wants to know why they um, why they only ever see the NRA ads. Uh, what's your answer to that? I think, I think you touched on it a little. Yeah, I think, um, well, we don't know, but we're assuming that Google will only take their ad money. Yeah. Right? That's probably like their default ad. Sometimes you see that USCCA insurance one, and then they kind of I saw a couple of, Vort I, like, it was a really weird thing, but I saw some Vortex ads for a little while. Hmm. The yeah, six. Yeah, and I remember seeing some holster stuff, that holster that you put in your pants, that thing yeah. that was for a while. So it, it yeah. might be that the companies don't bother to spend the money on Google, which it could be. The, the NRA is just probably spending money by default on Google, but most of the other companies probably look for other options. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And one of the things I think, I don't know if people realize this, but the advertising is individual. So it's not based on everyone who watches this gun video sees the same commercial. It's based on things that they're pulling from cookies or whatever that's telling them stuff about where you've been. And they're calculating who you are. Are you male, female? Do you live here, there? Do you have these interests? You know, and, and then that's why you see some advertising. So 
Uh, as well as being into guns, I'm into cars. And when I look at YouTube videos, I see a lot of local, like local to Gainesville um, uh, TV commercials for like, you know, Gainesville Honda or something like that. Speaking of that, I remember you did a video on the camper. Is that still a project on? Oh, yes, yes. Did, did you like that? Heck yeah, that seems pretty cool. So uh, yeah. how far along is it now? Um, well, um, so the RV is, is still a work in progress <laughs> because it's a, it's like a big thing. I was actually there a few days ago. So the engine that we, you're talking about the RV, right? Yeah. That we're making into a four by four. Yeah. So we took out the 440 that was in it and we still have that because we haven't sold it to anyone. And then I'm kind of tempted to take that 440 engine and build some kind of Mad Max car out of it. And, uh, and then the engine that we got, um, we couldn't get it to run in that RV. It, it works and everything, but we couldn't get it to run in there. So I think that we're going to have to get maybe a little bit more older or what the uh, guy that's doing it called like a more mechanical engine to go in there. So we have to find that. You know, this is how, these, this, is how this kind of stuff goes. It goes kind of slowly. Yeah. Well, like that, whenever there's a hurdle or whatever, now you got to figure out how to get around that. Yeah. The big things that I have to do is get the engine in and then we've got the, you know, all the other four by four stuff that goes along with it. Once that's all set up, all the other things are, you know, will really fall into place a lot faster, but the engine's kind of like the big hold up. So, you know, we are still working on that because I'm not, I'm not giving up on it anytime soon. And then I think this way it'll be more apocalyptic anyway. It'll be able to survive a, like a, you know, an EMP or something. I don't, I don't know what you think the likelihood is that we'll actually, you know, we'll actually you're, see that kind of emergency. Like get going further back from fuel injections back to carburetors, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what's the goal then? Is it going to go road trip with it and take the show on the road? Yeah, um, yes, that's that's what I would like to do eventually, you know, and, and, and I want to have something. Obviously, it's not like going to be a big off-roader. But I'd like to have something that if I go to the shows, when you go to gun shows, the uh, not big shows like NRA or SHOT Show, when you go to the smaller gun shows, you typically have to go off road to do stuff. So I like the idea of just being able to drive out there, camp out in the thing, hang out with people and, you know, just travel around. I'm, I'm not in a big rush to do it because uh, one of my kids graduated high school and went to college. And so we still got we still have one that became a senior in high school. So my plan is, you know, once they're both in college and just doing their own thing, then I'll, I'll live at least like half the year on the road. Yeah, well, you're pacing it. Like you say, it's not like it's a turnaround and the things, the project's finished or anything. So that way yeah. you've got time to finish it. Okay. Yeah. Also, you know, I'm always jumping around and doing a bunch of different things. So, you know, um, there are other, other projects and all that that I've picked up. And in the meanwhile, what I did was I got a um, – I got a tent, like a rooftop tent. Have you seen those? Well, just the pop-ups? Yeah. Yeah, it's because uh, it, I have, um, we have a Toyota 4Runner, so it's this thing that you put up there. It's a tent. You oh. like flip it over and you can climb up. Yeah. You like that? I've um, seen them. I've been up in one. Yeah, they're relatively inexpensive, and uh, Lola and I used it once. You know, I'm not, I haven't done a lot of camping. I would prefer to have something like the RV, to be honest with you. And so I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do a tent on the ground, man. That's really, I know that sounds bad. Well, I guess I see the concept there where you don't have to, it's way less setup, right? You basically stop, you flip that thing open, climb up there and you're, you're camping. You're not yeah. right around spreading out a tent and I'll make a campsite and all that. Yeah. I know there's pros and cons of like doing the rooftop tent because you have to close it up if you're going to drive off where the one on the ground, you could just put on the ground and then drive off with your vehicle. So, um, you know, it's a tough thing. I see. Do you know Schmeggy 42? Yeah, he's my co-host on the uh, Daily Gun Show. Oh, cool. Okay. So that's okay. I was listening in on that before we jumped on. Okay. He says I should join the live chat. You know what? If you guys will have me, I'll jump in there a couple times. Heck yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah. check out our channels. We built it so that people are creating content and have a place to, uh, you know, collaborate with other content creators and then share an audience that likes grassroots stuff, doesn't like, the, isn't looking for the highly polished stuff yeah so now we were talking about we were talking about my rv project i know you've got your van right yeah yeah, yeah. so um there's a couple things i want to ask you about the van now are you still on the red dawn tour that's like a big question i'm getting from everyone 
no, that was just a couple of days just to test it out. So I had bought a van last year to go on a road trip, and it got through California and then fell apart. So I've been waiting a year trying to decide. Basically, putting an engine and transmission into a van is the same as buying another van and starting another potential headache. So I did that. I bought a second van, and uh, that that four-day trip was just to test it out, 1,500 miles to see how it ran. Okay, is this new van a more modern van than the old, than the previous one? Yeah, the other one was a '86. This one's a 2002 Chevy. Okay, okay, yeah. So and and then you would do the Red Dawn tour for anyone who doesn't know. Red Dawn's your favorite movie, right? Well, it's the best movie ever made. So yeah, like <laughs> yeah, best movie. Ever. It's a pretty good movie. Um, do you like? Do you want to tell folks on, on my channel what the uh, whole Red Dawn tour was about? Well, okay. So the Red Dawn thing was just because last. Uh, August 10th, right? Last Thursday, I guess, was the 33rd anniversary of the movie coming out. So I, last year I went up to Copper Star uh, Gun Shop in Cottonwood, Arizona. So about an hour north of Phoenix. He's got one of the RPKs from the movie. So they took a, 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 a finished Valmet, uh, converted it to full auto, and then mocked it up to look like a Russian RPK. Uh, that's when okay. Swayze used in the movie. He's got it there for rent. So last year on the anniversary, I went up and shot that and we did the live show from the Copper Star. So this year I wanted to one-up that. So we went out and Smeggy and I had spent some time on Google Maps and looking at clues online and we found the place where the guy holds the AK up in the air and yells Wolverines. Mm -hmm. Like we found where that location was. So yeah, that went, mountain. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. uh, we found that filming location. So I went up and found that. And then uh, at the beginning of the movie when the guys run out of town and have to load up at Robert's dad's like gas station slash gun shop, right. we found that shooting location was too. So that was the goal of this trip was just to put some miles on the van and see how it works and then uh, check out those locations on the anniversary of the movie. So we did our live show from Las Vegas, Nevada, or from Las Vegas to New Mexico. Okay, very cool. So I just want to remind everyone watching again to uh, definitely share this on your social media, let everyone know that we're what we're doing here and hit the like button. There's a couple of questions I want to ask you about those videos and, and, and folks, you can definitely put in your questions. We'll get to it. Lola's monitoring all the questions. I'm looking at them as well. A um, couple things, a couple things. So with the mountain, I noticed that you refused to give out the location. Yep. What's up with that? <laughs> because then it's no fun. So it exists and it's totally easy to find. It took us about an evening to figure it out, just playing with Google Maps and using some clues. So uh, yeah, it's no fun if I just give everybody the mile marker and a GPS. So uh, oh, so what about like your Patreon people? Can they can they get the location from you or still or no? No, I tell them it's <laughs> closer, but not, not. I mean, like I say, it's <laughs> here's the thing. There's already graffiti all over it. Somebody's already, I don't oh, know. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't. Actually okay. painted all over it. So mm -hmm. I don't know just think hey this is a great spot to spray paint or if they're doing it intentionally but yeah. um yeah it seemed like a, it didn't seem like there was a lot of traffic going down that road i think i yeah. heard like one car in your video maybe one or two cars there was actually a lot more traffic than i would have thought um uh because it is kind of in the middle of zero like nowhere literally yeah i didn't mention why they even figure how they even figured out that location i mean they must have a good job of scouting they probably did in airplanes or something yeah. Did you, when I was watching your video, I was, t I was like, man, that would be, I would just go there and make, a, make a movie. I'm sure. Were there any, like, have there ever been any fan films that people maybe went out there? You know, I don't know, but there should be. And uh, yeah, now that I've been out there, um, just the way that the trip worked, I didn't want to spend forever out there. Um, I didn't have forever to spend out there. I should say, um, I think I figured out how to get to the top of the rocks, like the way the movies would have done it instead of climbing up the rocks. And, uh, We'll go out there again and film and get some pictures from up there and yeah maybe do some kind of playing around yeah it was it's uh it was very cool i know you were in you said you were in the town you showed a couple things there in the town and then in the in one of the videos i was watching there was like a rattlesnake yeah that we're talking about on patreon i'll post that as a video on patreon oh, okay. and allow, yeah. you know one of those kind of things but yeah that's yeah. just a little side story that i found a had a little encounter with a rattlesnake out there it was kind of fun so yeah. that's the kind of stuff you can never tell when you're on a road trip, right? You never know when you're going to find something interesting like that. So um, anyway, that's the point. So we we got the van and it's good to go. So we're calling it the Gun Show Loophole Tour. And okay. uh, we started it last year, went out to California and uh, saw the uh, Ring of Fire where they made all the inexpensive Saturday Night Special type pistols around okay. Los Angeles. I've uh, always liked those guns. So I went out last year and uh, saw most of the factories. 
got pictures and did little videos in front of each of the factories. Uh, that's when the band broke down. So the goal of the trip, though, is to then drive around, go to gun shows on the weekends, and then uh, mm-hmm. go to a gun shop every single day. So we're trying to get out there and see shops and find the little shops that are out in the middle of nowhere that are awesome. I uh, just went to a couple on the way back from the Red Dawn shops or Red Dawn places that were, you know, kind of for hunting, like mm-hmm. you know, all in like hunting towns. And uh, just found a little surplus store up there that was awesome. A couple of gun shops that are just amazing. And uh, that's the goal is to get out there and find these little shops and give them a little uh, plug on the Internet. Let people know they're out there for people that might be traveling or move into an area or hunting somewhere. Yeah, I think that's a cool thing. So the Red Dawn tour was like a little detour inside of the uh, gun loophole. Uh, exactly. the, yeah, the gun exactly. loophole tour. Okay, cool. So so now that you've um, got everything all tested out, you'll be getting back to that. That's the goal, yep. So basically I'm trying to clear the, the things, trying to get it figured out so I can do my editing along the way. You know, big problem is you go out and you collect a bunch of video and I just don't want to acquire video. I got to figure out a good way to get it out there presented as well. So. Uh, we do the daily gun show, so a lot of it'll be, you know, uh, talking about these gun shops every single day. Okay. What? So, and I know you were saying earlier that people don't really need a lot of, um, you know, technology to get into this. Do you talk about what kind of stuff you use to run your channel in terms of cameras and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm definitely a minimalist. Minimalist. I use the uh, what is this thing? A Galaxy, whatever the rugged Galaxy Five, maybe even. It's not even okay. that new. So, okay, so uh, a phone. Yeah, I'm doing everything off of a Android phone. Uh, I used to do everything. I've done every, like you mentioned, I've got 4,000 videos up there. We've done every single video with like a $70 camera. Um, back when we were doing a lot more videos, uh, we just bought the same camera over and over and over so that we'd always have the same batteries and you know parts when they'd fall apart or break. And uh, we never put a lot of money into tech. So yeah, I've always been an advocate for uh, you know get into it, start doing it. And if it turns out you're a a, you know, tech head, you really like the gear, then go for it. There's all kinds of cool gear that's not that expensive, but, uh, you know, get started. Don't, don't wait for the perfect camera before you start doing it. Yeah. When I started my channel, my first video, I think I did it on an iPhone three or something like that. Um, you know, and I'm into technology and I like cameras and all that. I'm really into filmmaking. So I, I, I tell people the same thing. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what tools you use as long as you know how to use them and then you learn from it and then you can always grow and expand on that. But if you're not really into it, just use the simplest, easiest things for you and then do it. Another thing that's nice about a camera or a phone is that we all have them in our pockets. For the most part, everybody's got them in their pockets and it's not that hard to master the phone camera. It's pretty quick and you put mm-hmm. that or whatever toolbar so that it's easy to get to and uh, just get in the habit of taking pictures of everything that you're doing and then your gun stuff is just part of the stuff you're taking pictures of yeah absolutely Robert Sinclair says Wolverines you know I want to I do I want to talk about that um, uh, let's you know let's talk about the um, how often do you watch Red Dawn not that much anymore because I've seen it a lot so now uh, I watched it a couple of times getting ready to go up there when we were looking for those locations you know trying to figure out where they have the cameras, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. but maybe once a year or something. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, like one of the things I like, you know, I'm into movies. I'm assuming you're into other movies other than the Red Dawn movies, right? You're a movie guy. Uh, I like movies, but I'm not the kind of guy that's got like every movie on DVD in a big room or something. I don't have a okay. TV. I want, okay. but yeah, yeah. So, how did that be? like become the best movie in the world for you is it for me it's when I, I came to America in 1983 and that came out in 84 I think so yeah. that was like one of the first American movies that I saw from here right on yeah and how old were you then um, in 1984 I would have been like 12 years old right so yeah exactly I was just probably a couple years older than you and it's just that the time it came out we were in the Cold War and everybody was kind of feeling frustrated and I don't think we saw our out from it yet you know just a few years later it would be over we didn't know that though and uh, I just really like that it's uh, still got real bad guys communists right where it seems like uh, the politically correct stuff kind of mixed with uh, bad guys and they weren't just plain old bad guys like it was one of the last movies to have just plain old bad guys and uh, that the bunch of kids who didn't plan on it or didn't, you know, prepare for it or weren't anxious to do it, uh, just stepped up and did what needed to be done. And I just think it's a great message. And uh, um, 
fun movie um, uh, as far as the movie itself. But then years later, as I started to look at it um, in the bigger picture, I guess, years later, the guy who made it, um, Milius, Milius uh, was a big uh, or a good friend with Spielberg and some of the other guys. And because he was a gun guy, they were comfortable with guns. They literally like meet up and go shooting and stuff. If you listen to some of the behind the scenes or DVD extras, uh, mm -hmm. he was a big influence on those guys who had big influence in culture. So I think the Emilius was a good guy. Uh, specifically Red Dawn though, he wanted that movie to be authentic. There's some stories like the helicopters, the, the uh, CIA actually came up and wanted to know where these Russian helicopters came from because they made them so accurate. Uh, right. wanted, you know, the the, uh, the AKs to be authentic. So, and again, he couldn't see the future or nothing, but he made this movie in 84 and 86, you could no longer convert guns to full auto, right? So mm -hmm. the, whatever, 13 AKs that were Imadis modified into full auto, uh, owned by a, what do you call it, movie prop house, were used in all kinds of movies that if he wouldn't have done that at that point in history, we would have had ugly mock-ups of AKs in movies forever. We would have never had the opportunity to have those AKs in so, so many movies and TV shows and stuff. So. I just think it was a pivotal movie. It was also the first PG-13, which I guess is kind of neat. Yeah, that's a historical thing. I think it was like, te like technically, there was another movie that was the first one, but it didn't come out first. It was like wow. delayed. Yeah. 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 I love all the movie trivia. And I saw there was a documentary, because uh, I think it's John Milius, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a there's a good documentary on him. It's on, I think, either Netflix or Amazon or both of those. But... Yep. Um, Highly worth watching because again, he it shows how interested he was in guns, and he kept them in the culture. Without Melius, we would have had a really different culture with guns. I yeah, think. and he's responsible for a bunch of movies, even ones that he didn't do. He's done some iconic movies, but he wrote and and helped out on a bunch of movies out there, and he helped give that like gritty realism that lots of us like about those movies. Yeah, exactly. And if he wouldn't have done it, they would have made wimpy movies, and those movies would have been successful by default, and we would have never seen the progression towards more realistic, fun, you know, violent movies, basically. Yeah, it's just like the writers today. There's a lot. I'm always trying to highlight gun writers or, or fictional writers that are gun guys. Um, I know Larry Correa is one of those guys. He writes fiction stuff, but he's a real gun guy, and he puts that in his stories. Um, he does fantasy type things. And then Angry American, Chris Weatherman, he's another one that I've had on. Genuine gun guy, and his he does more like survival kind of things. Like what if there was an EMP and then all the tech got knocked out and people had to survive. So that's that's more realistic. But it's what I like about their stories that they both write. It's real, real true gun stuff that before I got deep into, you know, I was always in, into guns my whole life, but I really wasn't practicing it, right? I really didn't own the guns and go out there and shoot things. And I, I'm kind of, you know, I do a lot of writing. So before before I actually started shooting these guns, if I would have written stories, it would look completely different from now that I've actually shot them. And one of the things is like when you read books or look at movies and someone's talking about a Glock and there's a safety on the Glock and you come to realize this person doesn't really know about guns. Yeah, like the hammer or something and they're just saying things that they just don't know aren't actually technically accurate about what they're trying to say yeah yeah it really adds a, a lot of realism to it so i enjoy that kind of stuff so okay um you know what I, i'm sure i don't know uh, i'll look um look see what's uh what questions people are coming up let's talk about some guns man what kind of what guns are you into um that's funny because i've been more into second amendment type of stuff i guess than guns i have not had the cash so i haven't been buying them and ever since i'd say maybe 14, 13, 14, I, I kind of lost interest in doing show and tell. So okay. I went, bought a bunch of guns just to play with on YouTube. And, you know, that just, you know, just kind of got old. So uh, I quit acquiring them for that. And really, I was just acquiring collections to play with. So uh, I quit acquiring a while ago. And actually, I've been selling a bunch to pay for the tour and going out and doing stuff. And that's actually been a little bit, um, I don't know, therapeutic, I guess. Yes, yeah, you got good. really zen, I guess. Yeah. Well, seriously, like, like, no, I, I remember seeing like some real badass guns, like the five seven and stuff like that. In in your, you know, you doing videos about that. I don't know whether or not you've owned it, but I've seen a lot of really cool guns on your channel. No, nah, the stuff I never owned any expensive stuff personally. Um, have access to guns, of course. That always makes it easier to have a channel. But um, anybody mm -hmm. 
access to them. Just go out and be personable at a range and bring donuts to your shop once in a while. Get used to um, going to gun shows and letting people uh, take a break to go take a piss or get something to eat for lunch or whatever and watching their table for them. You can you know, get all kinds of relationships with people that get content for a channel. But um, I guess what I'm saying is just opening up the, uh, the uh, gun uh, uh, um, safe and having everything fall out. You know, compared to having some room in there, it's just a little right. <laughs> so okay, so a lot of the guns have been getting pared down, but you, do you still have the safes? Oh yeah, yeah. There's still guns. It's just that uh, okay. got the excess stuff. But anyway, okay. so I, I haven't been out searching for new ones. Um, I enjoy interesting little ones, but not so much acquiring them anymore. So uh, they're kind of tougher to enjoy, really, because there's not too many people that take them out to the range, and it's just sort of a you know happenstance if you happen to see something interesting at a range. So, um, okay. I, but I've been getting into the ammo more. Uh, okay. I started uh, digging, uh, collecting ammo, and just looking into it and researching it, and uh, that's one of the reasons I'm selling off some of my collections is to uh, start collecting ammo a little bit more. Okay, so when you say you're you're getting into the ammo, is that reloading or just you know having no, like ammo, collecting specimens and researching it and, and finding it. Okay, these two stuff. I like to research Kalashnikov stuff, and you know I've already collected bayonets quite a bit, and the other stuff doesn't seem to perk my interest as much as the ammo. And there's a lot of it out there. A lot of countries made it, so a lot of opportunity to. I guess what I'm looking for is stuff to look for at gun shows to search for, mm -hmm. and. That gives me something little and inexpensive to uh, to seek out. Oh, okay. So, what kind of um, cool ammo stuff have you come across? Or, um, I guess it was cheating because I just bought it, but I did find mm -hmm. one of the underwater AK rounds at a gun show a while back. Uh, it was about a couple years ago now, but that's probably the coolest thing ammo related I've gotten in a while. So, you wow. know, the AKs uh, or the, the commies kind of experimented with shooting a spear looking. Uh, AK underwater a projectile that looks like a spear basically and it had a weird looking magazine so uh, I grabbed one of them and then found out later that there's been quite a few of those available over the years you know, they're not quite as rare as I thought but uh, still fairly difficult to obtain that's interesting so how does that work I mean is it just something that pushes out the spear or is it a big you know like it sort of looks like a 545 round with a giant piece of metal rod stuck out of it instead of a regular bullet and then oh, okay so it's a micro spear yeah it's a it's, it's a size of a chopstick or something a little bit thinner than a chopstick but a solid piece of steel and then just jammed into like a 545 cartridge and i guess that feeds up into a weird looking chamber and uh i guess it shoots better underwater than a small projectile but okay. it uses powder and everything so was that did they use that for shooting people on the I don't, water or <laughs> I don't know if they ever even used it. It must have been for people. Yeah. It was most danger, I guess, sharks. I can't imagine they'd care yeah, about Yeah, I mean, because I just don't see the Russians, like, going underwater, and they're like, let's make sure these AKs work against sharks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I can't imagine the kind of lethality yeah, I mean, the metal would have. Yeah, unless you have Sharknado. I don't know if you know what Sharknado is. Oh, yeah. Oh, you but do? Okay. You swim up into it, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I don't think uh, I don't think those would help you anyway against those uh, Sharknado sharks. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty indestructible. But that's why it's so interesting to collect that kind of stuff because the questions are are there. You know, who knows? Uh, there might be some documentation somewhere, but I guess that's part of the fun having to discover it. Yeah. So, and um, are there any like dream list things out there that you would like to find in that in that realm? Now, I've uh, had a chance to check out a really extensive collection, so I know that there's more than I'll ever imagine type of thing. And just uh, uh, when you look at ammunition for the stuff I'm looking at, it's either the type of cartridge, like the, maybe the material of the case or the projectile or something, or the packaging. So in both cases, there's just a ton of different variety there from all the different military versions. Uh, then once you get into the commercial stuff, you know, the commercial stuff over the various years, and uh, stores and manufacturers and stuff. There's just a bunch. So uh, that's the nice thing. That's one of the reasons I'm going to that. It's not like some of the other things where there's that one thing that you can collect to be like the star of your collection. It's just mm -hmm. more of a collect a bunch and enjoy the variety. And it's not none of it's really expensive or all that unattainable. Okay, cool. So I know you. I think you still go to Shot Show, right? Because I, I believe I saw you at Shot Show this year. 
Yeah, we met up this time, I think, for the first time. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, of course, I, I never knew what you looked like, so now I do. No. Um, no one knows what you look like, right? A lot of people do, I think. Yeah. So, um, when you were at SHOT Show, was there anything there that interested you, or did you go to SHOT Show more for, like, meeting up with all the YouTubers and networking? Yeah, mostly we were talking about this year at SHOT Show, my goal was to get everybody together and fight apathy, right? Everybody... Mm -hmm. You know, we have Trump, and I kind of suspected everybody was going to say, oh, we got Trump, we're done. You know, we had the little momentum going with the Hearing Protection Act, but not much else. So uh, I'm going to do that as my goal next year, too, I think, is just to, you know, that's a one opportunity where we have to get a lot of writers, uh, you know, writers for magazines and blogs and stuff like that. Uh, we've got podcasters. We've got YouTubers. Uh, we've got people from radio shows and television shows. We've got them all together in one spot. And on top of that, we have the entire industry there. So I'm hoping that we can uh, use our audiences for more than just making a buck or two and get some of this, you know, combat some of this apathy and move some of these initiatives forward and uh, get everybody together. I mean, like I said, it's an opportunity for us all to get together. I know sometimes like some of the shoots and stuff, we get a chance to meet up, but um, I think it'd be cool if we all found a conference room somewhere and just all sat around a table and figured out what can we all do to get one of these things passed or six of them passed. Yeah, I you know I do agree with you. I think there uh, I agree with you that is that there's apathy. I think we do need to get together. Um, do you think the apathy is with the general gun people out there relaxing and thinking they don't have to worry about rules, or do you think the apathy is also with the people on our side, the content creators, or both? Oh, it's hard to say. We're all human beings, so I think it's just we all got sick of that fight. You know, we all been really fighting since 2013. Mm -hmm. We all kind of got together and rallied together when we needed to, and then it's just been a big sigh of relief and a little bit of a, a tenseness here when we thought Hillary was potential, and mm -hmm. that it, and it's just that you could all you could hear that sigh of relief right after the election. So um, I think it's just everybody, and it's just the concept that you know when you're when when everything's good, that's when you reinforce your that's when you rebuild your resources, that's when you build your defenses for the next fight, not when the next fight is imminent. So I think we've got a lot of potential here. To, uh, we have a new uh, environment. You know, we can basically walk everything through. The doors should be basically held up for us if we really put our minds to it. And the last time we actually had to put our minds to it, I think, would be the M855 issue when uh, they threatened the 223. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of got together, and some of the mainstream helped kick that into gear just enough to, to stop it from happening. Uh, this would be a great exercise to get everybody together when we're not defending ourselves from something instead when we're pushing it give Bloomberg an offensive to have to defend against and then instead of him just having the open door to you know constantly push offenses towards us um, spend some of his money on the defense and yeah that could really change things again we have a lot of potential there's a lot of people creating content and they're looking for things to do that are new and different and we got audiences that are interested in seeing stuff that's new and being part of it and using this new interactive stuff that we've got with the internet and uh, yeah, I could see some real potential when we start moving the ball the other way, challenging things like the 4473. And instead of defending against universal background checks, let's make them defend the 4473 itself. itself. Let's make them defend the NFA using stuff like the, uh, the amount of suppressors that are being sold. It's incredible. Use some of these numbers to our advantage and start moving the ball the other way. So uh, like I said, there's a lot of opportunity coming and uh, hopefully SHOT Show will be an opportunity for us to you know, come to together. together. I, I think that, um, there's a couple of different things that go, hold on a second. I don't know why I'm getting the, okay. I think there's a couple of different things that are going on. Um, leading up to the actual elections going down, I think a lot of the companies just really adopted, not all of them. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of companies there that are real second amendment, real gun guys, but there are companies that just adopted a Hillary strategy, hoping that they would sell more than they did under Obama. Be, you know, when Hillary got elected because it looked like, hey, there was no way that Trump was going to get elected. And then that didn't happen. I think that people just weren't really letting on what they were going to get up to. So, um, and I don't think they hold any ill will against him. I mean, that's probably smart. If it would have gone the other way, that would have been the way to play it. Yeah, sure. You know, and, and if you're in the business of making money now, obviously it didn't go that way. So then they built all these, you know, they built the standard things and we've got a lot of them out there. 
So now they're not selling as well because people aren't in panic mode thinking, I'm just going to buy every AR I can, get every lower, you know, buy all the ammo and all that kind of stuff. So part of what's going on, I think, is that, um, and, and I think a lot of, from my personal opinion is that SHOT Show, a lot of the companies were stunned. I think there are good companies out there who are real, like, strong Second Amendment people, and they're out there fighting and all that, and, they're, and they realize the value that we have in working with us to do things. I think the flip side of our problem as well is us, and we don't get along with each other, and so that makes it very difficult for us to come together, right? You know, uh, like at the same table and, and put our stuff aside, you know, our differences aside, and say, let's get together and make sure we keep pushing our audiences out there collectively to keep fighting for these rights. True, and but that's the thing. I mean, we've had a. I don't want to say that it's never happened because there's been efforts towards getting everybody together for certain things before, and I think we all worked together in pretty good harmony back in '13, um, not with anybody coordinating it necessarily, but you know everybody did what needed to be done because everybody saw the goal was the same for everybody. So that's what that's what we've got though, and we've got that over some of the things like um, common interest in cars or food or music. Right? There's nothing that really is solid that holds that together those communities together we've all got the seconds deep down on top of all of whatever aspects of it we might be specifically interested in, we all come back to that second amendment and that's something that um i think a couple of the right people could bring everybody together and uh at least not everybody obviously there's always going to be somebody who doesn't want to play but i think it could create some different uh content going forward in the next year yeah, I, I would like to see that myself. I just think that, you know, and I'm not trying to be a downer on it, but honestly, from my perspective versus when I was outside and, and um, just a guy on YouTube watching everyone, and I thought, man, all these guys probably get along together and it's all great. And then from the inside, I realized that it, it is a little bit like that, but there's a lot of little kingdoms and, you know, people have you know, that like, don't deal with this person, don't deal with that person, there's all these different things going on. Or if you do something with this guy, then these people don't wanna do anything with you. And it, it kind of makes it difficult, you know, to put those things aside. Although I totally agree with you, we have to, we have to do that because otherwise we'll find ourselves not having any of these rights. Yeah, or we'll just be wasting our time, or, you know, each of us spinning our wheels in the same direction, but, um, I hear you, but I think that again, with the way that the things have changed, uh, it, we're not all just getting fed by YouTube anymore. So everybody's going to go out, get a little more self-sufficient. People that are requiring income to be able to do their thing are going to either figure out how to get that income or be gone. And then the people that survive it all, I don't think are going to be, hopefully won't be in that same paradigm. But yeah, we all came from that. I know what you're trying to say in there where there's like clicks and groups or whatever, but I really think a lot of that is because we're so YouTube centric and you know just YouTube has taken themselves literally out of the picture here they're cre they're they're creating um, places like Patreon being becoming a bigger part of our segment of the internet community or whatever so uh, as YouTube becomes less of the big uh, player in the game uh, there'll be more collaborations I think you've already got people that have come up on Instagram or come up on Facebook and either don't use YouTube at all or just barely. And, you know, there's less, uh, there's the same clicks and whatever out in those different platforms, but they do come together and you see some collaboration cross platform. Yeah. I, listen, I, I totally believe that there is a potential for it. And I think someone like yourself is, you know, you're, you're in a good position to help do that, you know, and, and sometimes we don't, you know, because of the technology we have, we don't have to sit down um, at, across from the same table, believe it or not. Sometimes that's not the best thing to do with uh, some people and different egos and things like that that we're dealing with. But however, if we have these common issues, like we can all agree, have you seen the stuff that's going on in, Ar in Argon? Um, with the confiscations? Yes, with, yeah. Just heard about it, haven't looked into it at all. Yeah, so that's something that's out there. I mean, I know they were trying to push this bill and then they were able to push it through the uh, Oregon. I know I'm probably not saying that right. That's, was, that's where you could tell a little bit of my accent. So I don't know if I'm saying it right, like I should be saying Oregon or whatever, but the governor actually signed this. So now it's a law that if uh, members of your family or police 
think that you're a danger to yourself and other people and you own guns, they could take your guns. You know, that's law now. So uh, I think things like that and other things that are coming up, we can all get together and agree on that. And if we had some kind of like clearing house or a hub that we can go to where it says, okay, you know, you don't see each other's differences. You see the things that you have in common. And these are the things we want to fight. And we're like, let's fight this, you know, on this day or at this time, let's all push on our different social medias, YouTube, you know, uh, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, Facebook, whatever you're big on, push this, you know, I think that's a way to go about it and to yeah, do this. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm listening to you. Right on. Well, I think you asked originally what I, what I, what I thought of you, uh, SHOT Show, and that's mm -hmm. basically what I'm thinking of SHOT Show is that kind of resource. So, yeah. Um, Aside from that, though, we've been going since 2005, so I really enjoy just seeing the evolution of it. Uh, it you know, it changes. Uh, there's a certain amount of it that's consistent over the years. Um, obviously, the, you know, we've met people over the years, so there's certain people that you can imagine. There's a couple of people, let's say every year you meet one new person who then you're going to say hello to next year. So that's 15 people that we're usually looking around or more, you know, to say hey to and just kind of catch up on. And then uh, uh, I've always liked to, or I've enjoyed watching the uh, evolution of the YouTubers. So um, when I first got there, there was a lot of, um, like when we first started doing SHOT Show as media in 2005, it was mostly uh, foreign press. And then the US press was writers and they had a photographer or something, but like they didn't carry around their own cameras. And there was digital cameras, of course, in 2005, but um, they were junky and pretty elaborate, and most of the filming was done with regular cameras back then. Still, mm -hmm. and then, those big, heavy things you got to put on a tripod or lug on your shoulders. <laughs> glass and film and all that stuff. Yeah. And then a couple of guys, uh, Millspec Monkey was already doing video and stuff, and uh, pretty elaborate. So um, just over the years, seeing the transition from the writers to and the foreign press to the YouTubers has been awesome, and just the. Uh, I don't know if you pay attention to SHOT Show over the years, but you'd, you know, SHOT Show would happen in January every year. It used to travel more, but um, it would happen in January always. And then we wouldn't see articles until later in the year, like June, August. We yeah. would see articles. So new stuff would happen, and we didn't. We knew it was coming, but we didn't know nothing about it. And there was no thing to re re uh, reference that to, so that didn't seem out of place. But to see the evolution over the years from SHOT Show of uh, – you know, months later, weeks later, days later, moments later, and now live. Instantaneously. Just, yeah, it's really cool. And yeah. people like yourself that come in and bring your, like, uh, angle to it is awesome. So I've really enjoyed that part of SHOT Show. And I don't know if I really contribute that much anymore because I don't produce much, but I hope that, you know, I'm gaining perspective over the years and, you know, for stuff like this, I can offer that that insight to it. Yeah, I think that's what one of the great things about what you do, man. I think you do contribute, you know, but I think this is the whole thing about history, right? And having a perspective of history. And some of this stuff is kind of going on now where people are trying to erase history and pretend that something didn't happen, it didn't exist. And I think that's dangerous. I think you need to remember that stuff happened. You know, you need to have these landmarks or monuments or whatever it is that says this thing happened. And obviously it means different things to different people. And I get that we're human beings, so there's no way around it. And so it's good to have that kind of perspective or someone to say to you, you know, so I'll give you a perfect example with me and you. So me being a younger YouTuber, I'm not, I'm not a young dude, but being a younger YouTuber, I might, you know, I re like for me, my experience of it is where it's this thing where there's million, you know, people, there's guys that have millions of subscribers, you know, hundreds of millions of views and, you know, maybe they're, they're making a lot of money and all that kind of stuff. And I see it that way. And I don't see what you just said that, um, yeah, back in the days, there was no such thing as this. So, you know, the fact that a person can come along out of the blue, you don't have to be had to have like military or law enforcement experience or any at all and just get into this thing. You don't have to spend a lot of money and you can actually do it and do it as a living and make a living from doing it. It's amazing. And sometimes we lose perspective of that and we forget about how much awesomeness we actually have because we just have this really small vision of this thing and not that whole long thing that goes along the timeline like you do. 
Yeah, right on. Yeah, I think that that's definitely worth uh, appreciating because, yeah, if you look at the biggest gun people on YouTube, there's two of them with military background, two. And there's, I, I'm thinking like 10, but none of those guys have any kind of military or police or any of that. It's just interest in firearms and ability to yeah. uh, get it across, you know, get the information out there. Yeah, and everyone's You're, doing it in their own way, you know. So, um, yeah, let me, uh, I, I, there's a couple things I want to do. I did promise, now I know you don't do a lot of show and tell stuff, right? But this is something that I saw at SHOT Show probably like two years ago. And you can see what I'm holding, right? Oh, yeah. I know we can't see you, but you can, okay. So if you can definitely see this, I'm holding uh, a Maxim 9 from Silencer Co. Silencer Co. Maxim 9. It's actually a reality. It's, it's They're actually, um, you know, getting out there, getting into gun stores. You could probably call up your local gun store and order these. Um, I got this one from Big Daddy Guns. They've got several of them in there. This is not my personal one, but mine should be here next week. Um, so I am going to talk about this. I'm definitely going to talk about this a little bit. Do you have any interest in this, G-Webs? I think they're super cool because that's one of those things that, you know, We'll have discussions. What's the in, what's the next innovation in guns? Right? Is it going to be like the the modular concept where the gun is just that little internal thing and your frames swap around it, or is it yeah. going to be something like this? And I think that uh, this has so much more potential since suppressors being restricted for so many years have basically stifled innovation. Um, they've never bothered to think about what would happen if you take some of that recoil or some of that energy. And instead of just diverting it into making the slide work, instead quiet it down and do something. I think there's all kinds of potential there. Yeah, and I, Monster Co is one of the coolest companies out there. So I've yeah. been painting this yeah since it was a prototype, and now I haven't shot one yet though. I haven't waited in line to shoot one. I've seen them. I've been to places where they were shooting them, but I figured I'd wait till I could spend some real time with it. I'm sure you've shot it already. Um, I did. Um, I have shot. I think the first time they let like the regular gun dudes get in, they, they've done a couple of things that I haven't been there. But this last media day, I went and I shot it. So, and then I'm going to be shooting this within the next couple of days. Um, yeah, I'm 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 amazed by it because you know what's one of the 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 really cool thing about this is that Silencer Co announced this thing two years ago probably you know not long into them having the idea and then it's like reality it's actually out there you know and they thought about a lot of things that we think about as gun guys like companies make stuff nowadays they make these kinds of things and they don't make it for a Glock magazine which is you know like yeah. the most common I know everyone's not a Glock guy but this is really common and it's a well-made Mac so yeah you know, so they made they made it for that. I don't think I don't think it's not exact. It's a lot like a Glock, I guess I should say. Let me. Um, I've got a Glock uh, 17 here, so it's a lot like a Glock, but it's not really a Glock. Now it does have the um, it does have MOS type of uh, you know cutout that you could put a you can mount an optic on it. It takes the Glock magazine, but there's a lot of different things in it, so it's not really. It's not a Glock or, or, or an M&P, but I like the fact that they just like stuck with the, uh, the Glock magazine. And it's a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. You know? So if you imagine that this is the first iteration, wow, where will we be if this actually like catches on? Where will we be five years from now? Exactly. Name anything that looks, everything looked clunky at the beginning. And this is almost elegant. So yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be amazing to see. Now, and especially if we get, like, some kind of relief when it comes to suppressors or the NFA, what do you think about that? Do you think we, we stand a chance of getting that or, you know, with all the stuff going on politically that that's moving further away? For everybody that's going to say we don't have a chance, then that's the surest way we're not going to have a chance because we have a chance to do anything we want. I mean, every literally, again, looking at it from, I don't know, whoever's listening to your show here, we got couple of 47 people listening right now mm -hmm. so uh, however many people are going to listen to this in the future um you know when did you start getting into firearms like you say most of us when we were young whether or not we were actually shooting uh we were already had some interest in firearms uh whenever that was if someone would have said to you you know probably 10 years ago yeah. illinois will have concealed carry you'd have been laughed at there, you know, literally that was that was so far in the future no one thought that was even a possibility now we're sitting here yeah. in a position where we got every single state with CCW that's done through 
not the entire country deciding, yeah, Illinois should have CCW. That didn't happen. A few people started with the Second Amendment Foundation and then you know, people that actually got it pushed through that were you know vocal enough and pushed it through, got it through. So HPA is the same thing. Uh, I hear a lot of discouraging stuff like, oh, it can't happen, blah, blah, blah. Nobody's going to do anything. You're damn right. Nobody's going to do anything if we don't push our representatives. But representatives' job is to do what we want them to. So we can either wait for the next offensive and then hope that we figure out a way to defend against that next offensive. Although Bloomberg is paying people lots of money to figure out how to be better at it next time around, right? Or yeah. we, this is an initiative to figure out how to rally the troops at a time when we're not on the offense at a time when we're simply trying to move the ball in the other direction, yeah, we should be doing every single strategy to move the HPA or the hush or the shush or any of them or all of them uh, through because this is an excellent example. This is a firearm that's being manufactured with an, an NFA item built, incorporated into it. It's not revolutionary 100%, but the concept that it's a mass marketed thing is fairly revolutionary. And what I really like is that it pushes up against that NFA. It, it, it gives that NFA a reason to not exist, another reason to not exist, um, along with the number of silencers or suppressors that have been purchased over the last few years. It's unprecedented. We and live still, in and, and still that are getting purchased. I mean, I know everything has slowed down, but when you when you hear that the wait times are still eleven months, that's a lot of that's a lot of NFA stuff out there. Look at the numbers. It went from t like thousands, thousands to hundreds of thousands. It's like nine hundred thousand suppressors have gone through. So it's just a, a massive number. And again, if we don't talk about it and we just say, hey, the HPA is wild goose chase, the HPA is, is dreams, then it's going to stay dreams. But if we look at it realistically, uh, it's, had, it's got the most potential of any pro-gun federal legislation that we've seen ever. And it's happening at a time when we got Trump. Yeah. So the only thing standing in its way is apathy. People aren't rallying behind it. We just need to figure out a way to get everybody to figure out this is the time to work together and figure out how to um, push those representatives. I don't care if they're not in session right now. That's the time to bug them so that when they get, they're off and running. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so there's so many cool things or and true things in what you said there. Um, one, as a kid, I, my dad's an engineer. Um, you know, and so I had like popular mechanics, popular science magazines and all that around, you know, being just being a guy, I was always into guns. I mean, this was like, you know, I was born in the 70s. This was like space age stuff to get something this small and all of that. And yes, we're here today. And then the other thing I agree with you on is that, um, you know, a, a lot of people, most people get defeated in their mind. You know, and if in your mind you just see that there's no way you can do something or, you, you know, you just or you cannot see that you could do something, then you're done. You're done for. You know, it, what happens is when you start to be able to imagine something, this is why like communists and all that, they always start by going after the artists, you know, and, and that's what I am. And that's uh, what, like why I'm so passionate about the Second Amendment. They go after the artists first because. We're the people that spark people's imaginations. So if I put that thought into your mind and it starts to live there and grow, you start saying to yourself, why don't I have that? You know, why can't I do that? Why am I not free? Why am I not able to do this thing? And that's what makes you, you know, get out there and do something. So yeah, conversely, if you think that, nope, I can't do it or that's not gonna happen or I'm gonna leave it up to someone else, then yeah, you're defeated. You know, and I also think it's amazing that um, like with Solicer Co, you know, right now um, to put this out so fast and still get it out there during a time when like the suppressor industry itself is, you know, going through some tough times. Lots of companies are going to get sold or, you know, go out of business and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it shows that they're really committed to something instead of going, yeah, that was a cool idea we had, but we're going to shelve it like lots of other people have done, and sit around and wait and see what happens. This is the kind of thing that I think that they're doing, even to their own detriment, you know, maybe financially or whatever, to say, imagine this. <laughs> yeah, and let's see this get out there. And it's just going to change things. People are out at the range shooting that. You get that casual gun guy who's at the range once in a while to sight in a gun or take somebody shooting or something. What is that? And now yeah. they know Hearing Protection Act. Yeah. yeah, and it's amazing. And then you start the conversation. And then if the guy goes, well, okay, so how can I get something like this? It's, you know, after the, you, you let him shoot it or whatever, and you say, how can I get this? And then they start to find out, okay, you've got to buy it, you know, 
cost this much money, and then once you pay all this money, you've got to go, you know, fill out this form and pay a two hundred dollar tax stamp and wait, and it's going to be, um, you know, maybe eleven months right now. <laughs> you know, if you're lucky, it could be six months before you actually get to come back to the store and take this thing home. And then he starts going, "Why? Why is that?" You know, and then when you get into that, he goes, well, that that shouldn't be. That's nonsense. That's how I think we start to uh, change these things. And that's, you know, kind of what's exciting to me about it on lots of different levels, you know. I think so. And yeah. then going back to the tech side of it, that's the first one. And I've always thought that you've got a lot of heat going off and we're using a lot of electronics now. So somebody's going to figure out that they can put a we call those thermocouple thingies that pulls heat and turns it into electricity. Oh, and like a heat, um, I, I think I have an idea what you're talking about, yes. The opposite of what they're doing with those stoves that you can power USB off a cook stove, right? right. So they're going to use such little electricity for some of these red dots and stuff. So I can imagine that if you take this tech and run with it, that they're going to be able to harness some of that energy and turn it into battery power or something or you know, do something yeah. with them we never thought we could because now they're harnessing some recoil that they couldn't before. Yeah. Who knows what they do? Absolutely, that's a great idea. You know, that's an amazing thing. So I, I encourage people. That's what I want to do. I want to encourage people, companies, and all that kind of stuff to do more things like this. Is there anything about this that you want to know? I mean, I know you've you've handled them, seen them at the shows. Anything uh, I could tell you about it? I don't know. I've been playing with them. Now the do the baffles come apart, and you can put different numbers of them in there. Yes, um, there is a way to do it. There, um, there's like different rods that come in the box here. Let me show you the box. So here's the, uh, I'm gonna try to hold this up. This is what comes in the box, comes in a box like this. You know, nice cool box. Notice this Morse code out here. That's what that is. And, and it's actually on the gun. And uh, then inside you have this. So you've got the gun and a magazine. Uh, I took the magazine out. You've got an extra magazine in here. And then you have a magazine that comes inside of it, and that's pretty much it. I think there's this little bag that you get with some tools, and then there's rods. So what you can do, if you look at it closely here, you can actually take out some of the sections. I think you could take these out and bring it down to this length and make it, therefore make it shorter, smaller. Um, it's not going to be, you know, your, obviously it's not going to be the same level of noise reduction. But that's the concept then. So you can physically make it smaller, lose some noise reduction, and then yeah. get as much noise reduction as possible and have the full size. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And still that's good. I mean, you know, if you think about a lot of this, right? So one of the things is if um, and I know they didn't just design this with just the police in mind, but they did do it as like kind of like a military police thing. Um, but if you're out there and you have to use your gun, and this is what's happening with a lot of I mean, they they're not walking around with suppressors. So if they get into a shootout, it's not like you see in the movies or you read about in some books that it's just this quiet thing or, you know, it's going to be loud and that's going to affect you in a lot of ways if you didn't um, expect that. So you have that. And even if you shorten it, it still may hurt your ears, but it's not going to do as much damage as if there was nothing, you know. Um, and then obviously it's the same thing for civilian use. And like I said, there's a Morse code. I, we were trying to figure this out. Do you know Morse code? I don't know oh, where I can just look at it and read it. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I didn't figure you could just look at it. We were trying to figure it out. It says something like silencers or illegal, something like that. We, we, we didn't go all the way in figuring it out. It's got, um, you can remove the slide, you can remove this section of the uh, slide up here. And it does, you know, that's that's it locked back. So there's the, the uh, rods that come in it. You know, so you can remove this and put an optic on top of it. Uh, I'm sure people want to know how the trigger is. I am like the triggers, you know, it's a lot like a, um, to me, like a bullpup trigger. You know, it's not the greatest trigger in the world. It's not going to be, um, you know, you're not going to be super happy with the trigger. But I, I think that you, you know, someone's going to come out with better triggers for this, right? I, I, I foresee that happening. And then one other thing, I thought there was going to be a holster with it but there's no holster that comes with it, although there are a bunch of companies that are making holsters, and I think that um, the the least expensive one I saw was about 50, 60 bucks, going all the way up to like maybe 150 bucks. And if you wanna know what these are being sold for, it's about, it's somewhere in the area of 14.99.
What do you think about the price? Hmm, that's a little steep, but what are you going to do? It's not yeah. like they have the facilities to make them by the tens of thousands yet. Yeah, if you're a collector and this is like the first wave, you probably will want to get into it for the first wave. And yeah, they do have to try to recoup some of those costs. But if you think about it, it's a gun, you know, so you're getting something not exactly like a Glock, but let's say a Glock's like 600 bucks, you know, and then the difference of that, like, you know, maybe 800 or whatever, that's in the suppressor. Obviously, it's going to be 200 bucks extra on top of that for you to... Um, you know, to do your paperwork. And this is the color it comes in right now, just like the old Fords, the historical Fords. It's like you, ha you can choose any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't say that you can't. Nowadays, you could Cerakote and do all kinds of different things with it. So I would suspect it's like you're saying, though, most people that are buying them are to get the first one, to get the concept up off the ground, get the company back some money, and then have one of the first ones. I don't think too many people are going to buy it and go shoot it out. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then, you know, we'll see what happens and we'll see if other companies, uh, what do you think about that? Do you think other like suppressor manufacturers or other companies will get into this space? Maybe if not with handguns, with rifles and, and things like that? Well, yeah, I can't imagine why not. I think it'll be more like uh, collaborations, right? Where you get the best, you know, two sides doing the side they know and then collaborate on it. Or places yeah. like Zig's already doing their own stuff. Yeah, and one thing I should say, if you notice, this has these the uh, magazine has the kind of like orange or red followers, so it is a P mag that comes with it. It is two P mags and not like you know the the Glock thing. Oh, and you know what? Another thing, it has key mod on the bottom. I forgot to show you that. So that's kind of interesting. Like I'm wondering why they went with key mod over M lock. Do you have any kind of preference? I'm an M lock guy. No, I don't really care one way or the other. That's interesting, though. So that way, there's no accessory rail. You'd have to put an accessory rail on it. Yeah, it doesn't come with an accessory rail. I think I grabbed one from the store. I had one around here somewhere. So here's a key mod accessory rail that you can, you know, put in there and tighten it, and then you can put no, that's it away. A, but that's a standard one. That's not like one made specifically for this one. No, it's not made specifically for it, but this uh, fits on there. But, yeah, they didn't have they didn't have one. So I know like from, from what I've heard from complaints from people, they're like, well, how come it doesn't come with the optic for that money? <laughs> so, you know, what do you think about that? No, I come with no, because then if you don't want that, then that's wasting money. You don't want it. Same yeah. thing with mystery rail. I could see somebody not buying this to put a light on it. And then yeah. just as happy that there's no stupid accessory rail on there. Yeah. Uh, and then, like you said, you know, maybe, you know, eventually this can be the kind of thing that it all is integral, you know, a light and all that kind of stuff if you need it. I don't know if you need a light on something. I, I prefer to have my light separate. I think you should have a light, but just have it separate. I don't know where you come down on that. Well, I'm all about putting my light on my gun, but that gun there is the first of a breed, so you can't expect it to be everything. And they could offset it. They're all about making things offset. They might be able to just move something out of the way and put a light in there. Uh, but I could see that if you're using it for vermin or whatever, you know, varmints at night, I could see having a light on there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you, you know, like you said, you have the option. You could choose to do what you want to do. So pretty cool. I'll be doing some stuff on this going forward, shooting it and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, any other things that, that are out there like that that you think, uh, you know, folks are pushing the boundaries Oh, I've always been fans of the stuff that complies with the NFA, but from six feet away might not look like it. So obviously the new stuff, I think, is the, um, uh, what is it, the TAC-14 and whatever Mossberg calls their firearms, 12-gauge firearms. Um, yeah, I, I know. It's, um, it's shockwave? the shockwave, yeah. So those yeah. things are super awesome. And those, again, those are the things where, um, and like the mayor's legs and mm -hmm. whatever Horace calls those, uh, those kind of things years ago, right at the end of the assault weapons ban, people would make those, but they would be like a thousand bucks or more because they were had to be made. You had to source a receiver that was never anything else and then basically custom work all the stuff and then it would be NFA uh, and it would cost you a lot of money. And um, I think it's great that these mainstream companies are making these firearms and now putting them out. I just saw Mac today posted a thing about that the semi-auto thing they figured out a way to make a firearm that is a tiny little what's that semi-auto 12 gauge um uh, there's a there's one a... of semi-auto 12 gauge that uses mags 
Uh, he posted. Oh, something. are you talking about the six twelve from Cry Precision or? I don't think so. But no, anyway, oh, you're, oh, they're one of the. There's a bunch of them. It's like an AR platform. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, gauge. Yeah. They figured out a way to make one of those things into one of those firearms. So uh, I think those mm -hmm. things. And uh, again, having a mainstream company make them and have them exist any amount of time, months later, years later, hopefully not years, but any amount of time here, we can say, we can challenge the NFA and say, why do, why are you, why do you suggest that these guns need to be registered when look at all these guns from six feet away, they're the same gun for almost every yeah. characteristic, they're the same gun. They're not a cause of violence. Why, what's the justification for making these other guns registered? So I think these guns that comply, but look like they might not, uh, are great. So yeah. this isn't cool like that but it pushes the boundaries it complies with the nfa but uh you know does something different yeah it's just like uh the sb tactical brace or the other pistol braces that are out there that now yeah. they're even saying you could shoulder them so okay i mean why the hell do we have sbr things then you know why do we have sbr regulations in that case perfect time to challenge that really yeah and you know, let Bloomberg start paying money to to justify existing stuff so that you know He's not spending his money on your universe background checks. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me get to some questions um, or comments out there. Joe Carpenter says, uh, your voice is relaxing, and you're the Bob Rose of gun talk. <laughs> I'm sure, do you hear that? You hear that a lot, right? Uh, not anymore, because I don't do videos so much, but yeah, whenever I was doing videos more. Okay, okay. And then Mel the Nut says, is, G is G Webs going to the Milwaukee NRA carry conference? Well, I didn't even know about that. So thanks. What is this? Uh, yeah. So you guys have to, um, you know what, uh, is that the uh, fashion show thing? Someone has to tell me. I think, um, oh, is that for the, uh, for their, I think that's for their, um, their insurance, their carry guard insurance. I think that's related to carry guard, right? Someone let us know in the chat if that's related to the carry guard. Okay. Uh, but so, no, I haven't. So I'll check it out. Yeah. So, uh, so Smaggy Forty Two is saying the NRA screwed all, screwed all the other carry groups during the NRA show this year, um, and then they and some people want to know if you think uh, insurance is necessary. You know, what do you think about that whole thing that happened at NRA? Did you go to NRA? I did not go to NRA this year. What happened with NRA? So um, NRA this year was in uh, Atlanta. Right. And I think it was like about two, three days before the NRA show, the NRA disinvited um, USCCA, that other group that you were talking about that has uh, concealed carry insurance. OK. Um, they disinvited them from the show. So everyone was like, what the hell's going on? Why would they just, you know, tell this big group? That they can't come to the NRA show. Well, at the NRA show, they announced that they were going to have their own uh, carry insurance, and they basically invited the U.S. Uh, disinvited the USCCA and maybe some other groups because they were competition. <laughs> so, yeah, that was kind of cold. What do you think about that? And that's one of the things that I was alluding to when I was saying that you know we're supposed to be gun guys and getting along, but not really. Yeah, when it gets money involved, of course, then it's going to be a little bit less cohesive, I guess. But um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's the NRA show, right? It's the NRA meetings. That's what its main goal is, is to get all the members together and do their voting and stuff, and then uh, get together as, a meet, as the members. And then it's an exposition. So I guess I can understand that the position that it's lame that they would disinvite somebody like that. But again, it is their their picnic, right? So I can see why they might say that. And maybe they could have done it a better way. They could have said, hey, we're coming out with a competing thing. Is there some way we can play together or something? Or you give them an opportunity to say, I'm not going to go. But it is the NRA. They're not exactly delicate all the time. So yeah, I'm not double guess it too much. I think they do overall more good than bad. And I've had my comings and goings with USCCA anyway. So as far as okay. in <clears throat> I don't have a problem with uh, CCW insurance. I think it's cool um, that there's so many of them out there. It's a little frustrating, but just like anything, just like health insurance or something, it's frustrating. It's always up to us to figure it all out. But um, because there's so much to figure out, that's a little frustrating. I personally have the um, uh, the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network uh, 
one. So it's more like, uh, or it's, uh, it's the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Fund. So we pay in once a year, and if needed, if there's a lethal force incident, they will help find legal assistance and then uh, pay for it. And then you would have something like a CCW insurance, which typically pays you after you've been found innocent of a crime. Uh, then you would use that CCW insurance to kick back and pay them back. So it's more of a legal fund, and that would be a whole other show getting into all the different CCW insurances. But I think overall, right. it's a it's a good idea, just like anything, to be financially insured because you're definitely going to potentially get sued four different ways: at the civil and uh, criminal, but then potentially at the federal and local level, or you know the local and another level. So you definitely want to have resources on your side and the ability to pay for those resources. Yeah, definitely. I think it's something that people should think about. And then depending, you know, some places might be easier for you to deal with that, depending on what the laws are there. And some places might be more difficult, but I don't think you're going to escape it anywhere. Um, no, you don't want to assume you're going to escape. I'd rather be yeah. over prepared than not prepared. Yeah. And you would rather have a lawyer than to go in there and defend yourself. You know, that's probably, you know, not going to be the best thing in the world to do. So I think it's a good thing. You know what I think? Um, I think it's kind of like it's messed up for them to go that way and it's not good public relations wise. And I always wonder who's advising people when they decide to do these things and they think it's a good idea to just do this. Because if they were coming all the time to the NRA shows and they were setting up a booth and they were selling insurance and the NRA was okay with it up until when they decided they were getting into the business, then you know, what else is the NRA going to do that with? So let's say one day the NRA decided that they were going to sell guns and then they're like, you know what? Screw gun broker. We don't want gun broker to come to the show or, you know, they're, they're making, um, they're creating content. Maybe they decide, yeah, we're, we're making content. We don't want any YouTubers coming to it. So it's messed up, but you're right. They can do what they want to do. Um, but you're right. It's like they do it in a vacuum sometimes. And it's probably a factor of just being a big organization and, you know, it's not like one person guides it, but yeah, they should probably learn from some of their past faux pas and think about stuff a couple of times. They could have done it, I could say, so many different ways, it sounds like. Yeah. You know, back to them at least earlier, if nothing else. Yeah. And um, you know what, though? In the end, I think that the competition, like you said, if they're going to now get in there and start competing with each other, competition is a good thing for, in the end for the consumer, right? Oh, yeah. Always for us. Yeah. So it's not, you know, I think ultimately it's going to help people in lots of different ways. I think you will see maybe um, the USCCA come out and start doing their own things to compete with the NRA in terms of putting on shows and, and, and doing things like that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. It's not going to be easy to compete with them because they're so big. We all support them. I know I do. I give them my money. Lots of people do. I think people should keep doing that. You know, it's not the kind of thing that we need to burn all the way down. We just need to make some changes and tweaks inside of it. Oh, yeah. And there's definitely more gun owners than whatever they think. There's, if you get the number, either five, seven million NRA members, mm -hmm. something like that. And there's way more gun owners than that. So there's definitely, like you say, there's a lot of people support it, but some people only begrudgingly and not everyone with 100% support. So there's definitely room for other organizations to get large. And, and now that you're talking about it, I think USCCA does do a thing in Minnesota. Don't they do some kind of a show in Minnesota, a CCW show? Um, I think so. And I think that, I think that we're probably going to see more of that if they don't. I've never been to it. Um, and, and, you know, that's another thing that becomes difficult. Like, you know, when they starts for me, I know I can't go to every show. So I usually try to go to SHOT Show and then go to NRA Show and then there's different things and I always have to split my time because there's so many shows now. Um, it probably wasn't always like that. I mean, obviously you had like your small gun shows that people got went there and traded guns or people sold stuff, but now there's so many actual shows, you know, where it's a marketing thing and people want you to come there to, to, to make videos or show off their stuff or do this, you know, or to beat people or whatever. And I don't think, uh, for me, I know I just can't go to every single one of those things and then at the same time keep putting out videos and doing all the other things that it takes to do this. So if that is a way that we're going to split our resources, I think. 
but there's definitely a lot of those shows and that's cool because i think it is a good format and gun shows are kind of dying and these are these like exposition slash you know hands-on yeah. a little bit uh, some of them you can buy at like i don't know that trigger con sounded like something yeah. where you could pull triggers see what it's like you know at a range and then yeah. go inside and, and buy stuff talk to the manufacturers and stuff so yeah. uh yeah and then again we were talking about you know individuals creating content yeah, then that's all the more opportunity because these things happen regionally. Yeah, I think that, yes, it's because uh, I didn't go to TriggerCon. I, I have spoken to some people that did go there, and I have seen some videos. It's basically like a a, um, a version of Media Day, and I think that's great. Yeah. You know? So, did one for a while. I mean, Eric kind of did one. There's that one in Florida. That one, I guess, isn't open to the public, but yeah. we're going to see more of these as the big ranges um, even now, have you seen all the Glock stuff going around? Like Glock is sending out the new guns to these different ranges and they're all promoting that come yeah. down to see the Glock on the first day or whatever. Yeah, I think in a couple of weeks we're getting maybe Gen Gen 5 Glocks. What do you think about that? Sounds pretty neat. I don't really, I don't, I like, I quit liking them after threes as much, but um, it's neat. I mean, it's a big company, so it's neat to see them doing yeah. something to get people excited about it. Yeah, innovation innovation wise, I think it'll be cool. But Glocks don't make a huge jumps, right? The three is definitely different from the four. I have, um, I don't. Well, actually, the only three that I have is uh, I built up the Polymer eighty one. So, are you familiar with Polymer eighty? Just from people building them up, yeah. Yeah. So you know, this is kind of like don't tell anyone, but this is what they call a ghost gun. Wait, police don't even know about that gun? <laughs> no, man. Don't tell, don't tell them about this, that you could do this. But, um, you know, so this is my only Gen 3 thing that I have. And obviously, it's uh, Gen 3 because that's out of patent, right? Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, so you can, you know, you can do stuff and then Glock won't. I think they still have the pat the patent on the Gen 4, but most of my Glocks are Gen 4 stuff. So, and it doesn't seem like there's big massive changes, but you really can't mix too many of the parts and all that kind of stuff. You know, even they don't, they even though they didn't do big changes. So I'm thinking that when it comes to um, the Gen 5, I'm wondering if it's going to be that or there's going to be some kind of massive leap or dare I dream that they're going to announce the carbine or something like that, the Glock carbine? <laughs> I don't think so. Just because I've seen the boxes <laughs> they show are pistol boxes. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm, – what, what do you think about that, G-Webs? Do you think there is a carbine? Because I hear that there is. It, does one exist? There, I'm, I'm almost positive one exists. Like they must have played with it in testing or whatever they call, you know, Q&A or whatever. But – I don't think they'll come to market real soon or anything. Yeah. I don't know though. Look at how many nine millimeter ARs there are now. Yeah. So it's it's uh, almost like it's it's almost like it's too late. You know, that's the thing. Like I, I believe that Glock has several iterations of some kind of carbine. There's no way in hell that the engineers and all that over there didn't think about it, draw stuff up, work on it, do prototypes. But Glock just doesn't have a need. They sell all the Glocks they make. They don't have a problem selling them. Yeah, exactly, and they would have to tool up to do all that. So I think they're either waiting for tough times or, yeah, you know, real need yeah. to do it. If they're gonna, yeah. But they if may, they and they're not worried about the money because if they were, if they put it out, I guarantee you. Like if I had to choose, you know, Glock Carbine or like Maxim Nine, if I had to choose, I'm getting the Glock Carbine just because you know, like what Glock made a Carbine's putting it out. But I don't think they care about that. No. You know, I agree. Yeah, Glock's just not those kind of guys. So, what kind? Do you have any idea of what changes you think they will make? Uh, no, I honestly didn't even pay that much attention. It's probably going to be some version of that military one, I guess, the FBI yeah. one. Okay, so, so it might have a safety on it. So, what we were saying about how Glocks don't have safeties, the yeah. stories will actually come to be uh, true now. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they do something like that because it seems like they're chasing the tail now. Yeah, that they were trying to get the contract. Um, I don't know if you had any time to think about it or look into that whole thing with SIG getting the contract and the P320, and then there was problems, you know, with the drop test and all that. What, what do you think about that? Uh, no, I didn't really look into it too much. I can't say I was too interested, but obviously it was, I was around with, you know, when people were having conversations about it, and it sounds like they kind of stopped the testing short and kind of made their mind up. So, mm -hmm. you know, and in the big picture, I feel like uh, probably got, Glock got the the short end of that. 
but uh, I'm sure Glock, I don't know if they were really in it all the way anyway. Uh, you ever read the book Glock America's Gun? No. Tell it's me about it. It's a pretty cool book. Um, it's uh, about Glock, but it ends up being about just the gun culture in this country in a lot of different ways. So it's mm -hmm. a really neat book just as a gun guy, even if you're really not into that much in the Glocks, just because, you know, they touch pretty much all aspects of guns. Anyway, in that book, he talks about uh, in whatever testing Glock was in, maybe it was the testing for the Beretta, you know, replaced the 1911 mm -hmm. uh, back then. But Glock did, one of the stipulations is you have to give the patent to the U.S. government so that then they go to whoever the bids on building the thing. And okay. Glock is interested in that, according to the book. So if that's still the case, and he's not really interested in giving a patent to the Glock over to the government, then I'm not sure they were really all that into it. They might have just been doing it to do it so they could release a gun that was in the trials. Because mm -hmm. lots of companies are happy or satisfied, it seems, to be in the trials and then sell a gun based on the that status, you know? Oh, okay. Uh, so this, so Glock, The Rise of America's Gun, I think it's by Paul M. Barrett. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know if that's any relation to, like, you know, like the it's Barrett. Oh, okay. No, there no. you go. I met him. I was actually, I read that book and I thought it was great. I didn't read it. I listened to it on tape. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. what I did. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome technology, man, when they when they started making audio books. Seriously, especially when they're on a bridge because you're hearing them. Well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I really do love it. That's how I listen to it. That's what how I consume most of my books nowadays. I read, a, I still read, but you know. Well, this I was, I thought that book was great and everything, and then I was just sitting there at the media day, minding my business, and this guy comes by and drops a card down for the book, basically saying there's a book signing or something. And I said, oh, hey, uh, this book is great. And he turned out to be the author. So he ended up giving me a copy. And uh, I think I did a quick little interview with him there in the media room. But uh, he's just a writer. He's not even a gun guy. He's just, uh, I think he's, he told me at the time his next book was like about skiing or something different. You know, it wasn't, he wasn't a gun guy. He just was a researcher type of author. Okay. And uh, yeah, pretty cool book though. So you, and you've got an interview with him. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah that's... just. I was kind of curious just to find out if he was a gun guy and how he got some of those interviews and stuff. And uh, a little bit curious if he was related to Barrett's, but he's not. Okay. And you did read the book. You said you listened to it on audiobook, So it's, it's worth the, uh, the listen or the read. Oh yeah. I would, I would say as far as books go, um, you cannot go wrong listening to that book. Like I see, even if you're not interested in Glocks that much, the, the phenomenon of the Glock is just very interesting as far as how it relates to the gun industry here. You know, just things like, um, there's one little story about the SHOT Show whenever they came out with 40 Smith & Wesson. You know, the mm -hmm. ammunition company came out with it. They called it the 40 Smith & Wesson, intending to have Smith & Wesson build the first gun for it. And uh, Gadsden goes over, takes a look at it. They're showing off his bullet. He puts a couple in his pocket. He goes back to the booth and says, make the gun. <laughs> and <then laughs> made the Glock, 20, or Glock uh, 22 before Smith & Wesson could even get off their butts and make their own gun. So it was just little stuff like that that's interesting. And... Um, yeah, they, they did some interesting marketing back in the day with the police and the way they, you know, it was just a crazy, crazy story. It, it, you couldn't make a movie. You'd think it would be like a, a fiction movie. It would, yeah. You know. I mean, and it's crazy what happened with Glocks, right? Because when they came out, there was kind of this myth that they were um, metal detector proof and all that. I think it had something to do with a uh, Die Hard movie. Yeah, seriously. And that the, the, the book goes into that. The, the, the expert on the set, you know, told them the actual to you know, facts about the gun but the director decided it sounded cooler to say all the stuff they said in the movie so they made that movie and literally a politician saw the movie got scared and created the undetectable firearms act based on what they said in a movie not based on any actual tech and then uh every 10 years it expires and we've had to deal with the repercussions talk about innovation or the lack of innovation based on just on that alone so every yeah. 10 years it expires and and people and it gets renewed yeah, I forget whenever it first started in 94 or something, and every 10 years it gets expired. There was a period of like three years there where it didn't get renewed, but then it got renewed again, and we're back on that same stupid cycle. And with the 3D guns, the 3D printed guns, is the last time it got, was like, what, a year and a half ago or something, is the last time it came up for a renewal. And instead of letting it just die, everybody came up with the fear of 3D plastic guns and uh, 3D printed guns, and it came back in. So yeah, now every gun has to have a chunk of metal in it. So any innovation towards the new polymers or the 3D printed parts and the you know intricacies that a 3D printer can do with internals, you know all the all that kind of innovation is basically stifled or at least uh, curtailed, you know, because you have to comply with some stupid 
fears that some stupid regulators had years ago. Yeah. But yeah, that's how Glock literally in, influenced stuff in, 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 you know, without realizing it just by existing. Now, I know that um, Glock had, I think, their 35th anniversary last year. I think, it, yeah, I think it was 35 years last year. And I know that they, um, they, they've they got some stuff in a museum in Wyoming. Have you seen that? Have you done something on that? No, I didn't know that. There's a Glock museum in Wyoming. Um, uh, you know, there's a, okay, I'm going to have to look this up. What is that big gun museum in Wyoming? There's the Cody Museum in Wyoming. Okay, the Co I think they I think they have a they have a section in the Cody uh, Museum. Hold on, I gotta look it up. Right on, that's pretty cool. Let me look it up. On, up there. It would be great. I mean, I would like to actually go there, but until I actually go there, then you know, uh, yes, uh, Glock Firearms Exhibit opens at Buffalo Bill Center of the West. So is that the same thing? Yeah, right on. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know. That. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm planning on going up there. We did the Old West Guns playing card deck, right, on Kickstarter a while back. Mm -hmm. And we're actually going to print right now. And I planned on, uh, one of the reasons I grabbed the van was to be able to take the trip up to Wyoming to deliver some of the cards up to that museum. So, Oh, sweet. If you go up there, man, and there's anything I could do to help, like, promote or, you know, help you get the funds together or something like that, I'd love to do it. If we can get you to come back on and talk about it or share, like, you know, you do some videos, I'll, I would love to share it. I'd love to see it. Right on. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, so we've got the the, the Indiegogo thing going right now uh, to uh, fund that. And uh, okay. your link here. But, no, that's awesome. Yeah. I had no, it was a Glock portion of that. Yeah, send. I, I don't know if you if you can send me a link to that in in our chat or, yeah. or somewhere. I will actually put that in the description of this video, and I definitely encourage folks to go check that out, and uh, you know contribute to that. Um, so you have the Indiegogo going. <laughs> that's that sounds a little um, that's a little difficult to say. What other things do you have going on, man? To um, you know that people can check out and support. Um, well, so we're gun websites, right? So we got a bunch of websites, so you can check it out at gunwebsites.com and dig into them there. We got Gun Channels, which is a community we built a while back. It's uh, focused on firearms. There's, like I say, it's kind of built it for creators, but uh, there's lots of people that just enjoy watching the content that's there. And it's uh, just an off-the-shelf uh, social media platform, right? So there's everything you can think of. There's forums and there's, we, we call them channels. There's, you know, places you can set up. So if you're creating a brand or a channel or something on YouTube, you can amplify it over there. Uh, then we've got um, the Daily Gun Show, where we do a podcast like this, except uh, I guess we're doing it at the exact same time. You you did yours an hour late today. Thanks for that. Um, oh, oh, you're welcome. Uh, happy to do it. But uh, yeah, we do that then. And, uh, and of course, the Gun Show Loophole Tour, which is what I'm trying to kind of move everything towards, because um, like I say, in the grand scheme of things, I'm more into the Second Amendment, I think, than I am in any specific guns anymore. So uh, selling some of the guns to kind of get things moving over the last couple of years has been almost therapeutic. So I'm planning on selling the rest of the collections at gun shows and using that to uh, fund exploring more gun shops and getting people interested in those local shops and some of the cool stuff ranges are doing out there. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's great. Um, now, I, I just posted the um, that Indiegogo link that you sent me in uh, the description. If it doesn't work or there's anything going on with that, just let us know and we'll correct it. But anyone who wants to check it out. Um, so my, my friend, uh, Walter Keller from Safety Harbor Firearms, he uh, I think he was out there with his family this past summer. And he uh, he wants to remind us that there's a lot more than the Glock stuff there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I hung out in Wyoming for a bit, so I've been there once. But uh, yeah, they've got actually, when you look at the history of Winchester, they have mm -hmm. like the only example of one of the first uh, in the family there, first in the line of Winchesters. Yeah. You know what? That would be, I think that would be a great place to visit. And you know what? It's too bad that we as like gun content creators don't have our own convention. So, you know, obviously we can go to SHOT Show. I've got nothing against that NRA and all the other things, but it would be great if we put together our own convention and then maybe did it in cool places like this, like the NRA Museum. And, and, and I mean, you've been, you've been going out and discovering this stuff. Well, what do you think about this idea, man? I love it. In fact, one of the reasons I was asking you about the camper, whenever I start doing that camper thing, I mm -hmm. even started bugging the guys over on Gun Channels about it. But, you know, you ever seen the movie Cannonball Run? Yes. All right, so yeah. we need to start somewhere and then get a bunch of YouTubers, get them all in vehicles, oh. and, 
and then have their Patreons putting the gas in the tank or something. And then, yeah, go to like, yeah, go here and there and the other place. Some of the things that I'm interested in are like the gun rights policy conference where all the gun rights organizations get together once a year. Uh, they kind of do a sit rep. They go up on stage. They talk about what they've been doing, what they're going to do, what they need in the future. And uh, it gives them a chance to network and all that. Uh, I think that that project's been going on for like 33 decades now, 30 years from the gun owners of America. I think that needs a lot of the attention that yeah. us people on the YouTube are playing with. So, so going to a place like that and giving it some attention. Uh, some of the museums, like we were just talking about, the Cody Museum is pretty awesome. Uh, the J.M. Davis Firearms Museum in Tulsa is basically the largest private collection. It's now a museum uh, run by the state of Oklahoma. Uh, it's right in the middle of the country. Uh, but there's museums in the NRA Museum in Virginia. So, you know, coming up with a couple of destinations and then mm -hmm. um, getting everybody to do some kind of a poker run or something. Yeah, this sounds this sounds amazing, man. I, I really want to do this now because I mean, even be, you know, I'm not going to wait to finish the RV. I think we all ha we're all into cars and and things like that. You know, we could just get together with what we have and do these things and get together, show off the cars, and maybe uh, help raise money for you know for different things like you're saying. I think that would be awesome. I want to do that. Yeah, I think that would be kind of a neat transition and a kind of a segue and gets people involved and yeah, uh, like for example, I'm driving around. I don't have fancy cameras. So what I'm really hoping is uh, part of what I want to do, like when I go to Cody, Wyoming, right? I'm hoping to meet up with somebody who's either creating a channel or at least has some uh, aptitude with some cameras and some cameras, ideally somebody with like a drone, because I can't afford to get a drone or nothing, but mm -hmm. it would be able to add that kind of footage to the coverage, right? So okay. meet up and collaborate with people, yeah. uh, then people are able to add their specialities and their expertise and their yeah. you know, resources to the project. Do you know, do, have you ever heard of the Adventure Cowboy? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't meet him, but one of my dudes met him two years ago at Chacho, Show, but he's out of Wyoming. I yeah, he's him. out of Wyoming. Yeah, I'm sure we can, We, uh, you know, there's other people that can get together there and help you. But I think this idea of doing like a cannonball ball style thing is something, obviously, every, all the gun YouTubers out there may not be able to make it, but if you got like a third of them and maybe did, you know, several, I think yeah, that'll be great. Shot show, or everybody's at shot show and leaves and goes somewhere, or everybody's mm -hmm. at Eric's shoot and goes somewhere, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely that that would be an awesome thing to do. Um, I'm all for that, man. You know, what what do you need to get that like going? Because <laughs> I love any, I love things like that, you know. And I've, and I always enjoyed those movies, and I always wanted to be part of it somehow. And there's lots of different runs that people put on, but. One that involves the gun guys, I think, would be pretty cool. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the first time we're really talking about it with somebody who's, you know, interested in participating in it. So we'll just uh, keep BSing about it and figure out yeah. who else we can find that's interested. And in yeah, we started small or started big. Yeah, but you know what I'll do? I'll think because what I do when I when I broadcast this. Like, you know, we're doing it live and then it's going to live on uh, YouTube, but then I take out a snippet. I think I will take out a snippet here of us having this conversation and, you know, put that as its own video. And then I uh, encourage everyone out there that likes the idea because it's a great way if you want to meet uh, gun YouTubers, you know, that, that you admire or you've always wanted to hang out with, you know, do some shooting or like, have you know have a drink with them somewhere or have lunch with them somewhere along the way, just hang out and talk or talk about guns and cars or whatever else. I think it would be awesome. And we should definitely do that. Cool. You know, we should definitely do it. So now I'm, I'm not good at organizing anything. So, <laughs> well, that's part of yeah. the challenge too. And like I say, it's always easier to do stuff under a deadline. So that's the challenge is to do stuff that doesn't have a, a deadline where, you know, still keep it moving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, I think we should we should try to do this, put it together, and and figure out a way to get this done. Not not just for us, because I think, for example, what you're doing when you go to these places, um, I think that helps a lot. So if there's anything that I can do that helps you out to be able to do more, you know, I'm I'm down for that, man. So I really appreciate I'm all, it. I'm all the way in on that. So I'll encourage. I don't know how I don't know how we'll do it. But let's start with like, you know, we'll, we'll share some stuff and see who's excited about it. And then maybe you'll have some ideas or something like that that we could put together and we'll talk about it more. Start organizing it and getting it going. Cool. Getting it done. All right. So, um, you know what? We, you, you've been doing this for a while. You've been very gracious. I know you're like doing double duty. 
you know um is there anything you want to promote before uh before we call this uh, a night no just our second amendment again this is a time to uh keep active and to get other shooters out there uh we're not under attack so it's a perfect time to you know talk about it at work and school or church and get somebody out to the range and uh you know ideally take some video or a picture or two and share it on instagram let people know you're out there enjoying second amendment yeah absolutely i agree with you okay so on my part i want to you know thank g webs for coming on it's been awesome man it, this is like dream come true right here i'm in a video with g webs what you think about that <laughs> yeah that's pretty awesome for me i don't know i don't know what you for you it's probably not so awesome but for me it's pretty awesome man so, it's a little weird just a regular dude just doing stuff <laughs> No, I appreciate it. And so I want to encourage everyone to go out there, you know, support G webs. We've got a link to the Indiegogo in the description of the video. He's also obviously on YouTube, you know, make sure you subscribe to him and, uh, you know, keep track. I mean, he's coming up on 4,000 videos, so we got to keep him encouraged and, uh, you know, help him out getting that done. Yeah. Give me some ideas for what would be a cool 4,000th video. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm going to, when I go to sleep tonight, I'm going to be dreaming about it. So, <laughs> all right. So other than that, I want to thank everyone. Like we've had a bunch of people in here making comments and stuff like that. And, um, I really appreciate everyone hanging out with us, especially that it's a little later tonight. I know it's Friday and everything. So I appreciate you guys. I just want to like shout out everyone that I see there, you know, Walter's in the chat, Chris B, Robert Sinclair, the Tyvon show, Kill Time, uh, War Decks. I'm just going to go through Ryan Baker, Kofi Bates, Enrique Sonora, Ryan. Uh, I, I think I already said Ryan Baker. Um, and I'm um, looking for someone, uh, Smeggy42, that does stuff with you. Thanks to all those guys. If I didn't mention you, you know, my, my apologies on that. I'll try to do it next time. I want to thank the people that sponsor my channel. That would be Safety Harbor Firearms, Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, and of course, Big Daddy Guns. That's where I got the Maxim 9 from. So, you know, if you're looking for a Maxim 9, call up Big Daddy Guns. Tell them Hank Strange sent you. Tell them you want a Maxim 9 and they will get you sorted out. But, you know, they also give us the space and all that kind of stuff here and allow us to just say and do whatever we want to do. And most importantly, I want to thank everyone on Patreon that supports us. We're Patreon slash Hank Strange. G Webs, what's your Patreon? Uh, gun websites on Patreon. Okay, so there you go. Pretty simple. Patreon slash gun websites. Make sure you go out there and support it. We, uh, you know, thank you guys for that, and we really appreciate it. Anything else, G Webs, you want to say before? I hit the button. Oh, thanks again for uh, uh, your hospitality and moving the show over so I can uh, be on. Oh, you're hopefully, welcome. Hopefully yeah. on our one of these days. We'll oh, absolutely, our- man. I would love to do it. Just let me know and I will do it, you know, and I'd love to have you back over here, man. It's been awesome. So stick right there. I'm going to hit the stop button. Thanks, guys. Peace.